Hello there, this is Fiona, host and main GM for What Am I Rolling, a twice monthly RPG one shot podcast. This is a bonus QA episode to tide us over to the next one shot, and it is indeed a very special QA, as this week I had the absolute pleasure of interviewing game designer, writer, and editor Graham Davis. Graham has worked extensively in the role-playing game industry since the 1980s, having worked on and contributed to tabletop RPGs such as Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay and GURPS. His latest project, Mythic Britain and Ireland, is the highly anticipated expansion for the Emmy Award-winning Vassan, a Nordic horror role-playing game, published by Free League. Based on the work of Swedish illustrator and author Johan Igerkranz, Vassan presents a gothic setting steeped in Nordic folklore and old myths of Scandinavia with game mechanics using an adapted version of the award-winning Year Zero engine. Now it's time for investigators to leave the Mythic North and set sail for the mishrouded isles of Mythic Britain and Ireland. In this new supplement, players will find a complete guide to the supernatural British Irish Isles, including information on the great fog-shrouded city of London and the countryside beyond. It's time to roam the islands and walk the moors in search of long-lost tales and ancient remnants. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to Graham about his work and about Vesson. I think it's one of the coolest horror role-playing games out there just now, and it's a game that's definitely at the top of my to-run list. The Mythic Britain and Ireland expansion will be out later this year, but you can pre-order your copy now on the Free League website. In the meantime, I can highly recommend checking out the core Vassan book and the latest Mysteries collection, A Wicked Secret and Other Mysteries, both available on the Free League website. I'll put links to Vassan, the supplements, and to Graham's other projects on the What Am I Rolling website and in this episode's show notes. We'll start off with a very, very easy question to get you into. So Mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who are you and what do you do? My name's Graham Davis. I've been in the games industry since dice were carved from flint. I uh, (laughs) worked for a lot of uh, tabletop role-playing games, best known for Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, probably, Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, a lot of video games along the way as well. And I'm here to talk about Fesson, Mythic, Britain and Ireland. Yeah, I'm very excited to talk to you about that. But first, of all, how did you get into game design, if I may ask? Like you said, you've got a, an expansive history and career, and it's it's just fascinating to hear about it. So how did you initially get into role-playing games? I started probably, uh, probably blame Ray Harryhausen. When I was about six years old, I saw Jason and the Argonauts on my parents' old black and white television and developed a fascination with mythology. Mm-hmm. Um Fast forward to uh, when I was uh, preparing to go to college to study archaeology because I grew up in the south of England and every mm-hmm. summer we were we were going around castles and Roman villas and what have you. And I uh, heard of this new game, I'm dating myself here, this new game from America called Dungeons and Dragons, which was, I was told, equal parts miniatures war game and improvised theatre. Unable to reconcile those two in my mind, I thought, well, I just have to go and see what it's about. And I went and played my first game of D&D. It would have been about 1978, I think. And I had two characters, both of them thieves, both of them killed by a minotaur in the first 20 minutes. Of but, course. Uh, I, but I was, I was hooked because there was a minotaur and there were all these mm-hmm. other monsters that I remembered from mythology. So then I went to college, spent far too much time playing D&D when I should have been studying. (laughs) Um, And this being the early 80s by that point, there were a lot of gaming magazines around. Mm -hmm. And I started sending stuff to them. And they started sending me small checks that uh, went quite a long way at the college bar. And uh, (laughs) by the time I graduated, I was a regular contributor and uh, Games Workshop offered me a job to help develop Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. And you've never looked back since, the, really. <laughs> I've been in the industry. As my dad would have said, I've never had a proper job since. No, no, not true at all. So do you prefer to run games or do you prefer to be a player in them then? It depends. Uh, I think it depends on genre, really, uh, mm-hmm. and also who's running the game. I was in a quite a long-running campaign of a horror game called Chill, which was run by a guy called Steve Hand I met at Games Workshop. He developed board games. Uh, Fury of Dracula was one of his and Chainsaw Warrior as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was great fun as a player. 
But all other things being equal, I, I like to GM because I'm an enormous ham. I love playing all the characters. And <laughs> I also love seeing all the unexpected things that players do. Mm -hmm. and then having to figure out on the fly how to cope with them and keep the game going. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. something I, I really enjoy. The improviser in us all is like, see, yes. like, the ship is going down. How can I fix it very quickly uh, <laughs> with all these other moving parts and stuff? I, it's definitely something I really enjoy as a GM, just to trying all these different systems and stuff and making these storytelling ways, but also challenging myself to be like, this can be a story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure yeah. together we can do it. But mostly if I push the players at some point to do stuff, they'll be okay on it. <laughs> That's right. There's, there's a sort of a, a roller coaster, dead man's curve kind of rush to when a game's about to fall apart and you can just about yank it back from the precipice mm -hmm. those are the moments i remember yeah and then they're like god what a great game and you're like yes <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes it was <laughs> yes i am that good yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely what i take from it not definitely not like that heart palpitation like oh my god like yeah. 10 minutes earlier whilst people were you know left right center like dying in combat or anything like that Let's get straight to it then. Can you talk to us a little bit about what Vassan is? Because some people might not have heard of it. So if you could tell us a bit what Vassan is and how does it stand out from other role-playing games? Well, Vassan is a, a tabletop role-playing game. It was originally developed in Sweden. And so the main setting is in what they call the Mythic North, Scandinavia. And it's a 19th century game of folklore investigation. Mm. Uh, Vesen is a, a word, I think, common to many Germanic languages, which means supernatural creature. It's similar to the English fairy when it's applied in its broadest sense to include ogres and whatever else. So uh, I saw uh, an English language edition of this game. And the thing is, I've been obsessed with folklore. Going back to my early D&D days, mm -hmm. I was always looking for more monsters to throw at my players. And I ransacked my local library and then later the university library looking for folklore and stuff. And along the way, I somehow got myself hooked on folklore itself. Mm -hmm. um, you might say I came for the monsters and stayed for the stories. <laughs> um, and of course, it didn't hurt that I was studying archaeology and there's an awful lot of folklore around various sites like Stonehenge and Wayman Smithy and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So I'd had it in my mind to do a sort of a folklore inflected fantasy game probably for 20 odd years. Mm -hmm. And I'd never, I did a, a GURPS fairy source book, but that was the closest I got to ever realizing this. And then when I saw Vess, I thought, that's the game I've been wanting to write <laughs> for 20 odd years. Oh, no. <laughs> so, but it's in Scandinavia. They haven't touched Britain and Ireland yet. So I fired off an email almost immediately mm. saying, you know, basically the Troy McClure from The Simpsons, you may recognize me from such things as <laughs> why I'm a fantasy writer, etc. Here is my CV, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And saying, what your game really needs particularly for English-speaking gamers, is a Britain and Ireland source book. Mm -hmm. And luckily they agreed. And they put me in touch with uh, Jan Akerkrantz, the artist. Now his art, if you don't know his art, look it up, dear mm -hmm. listeners, because it's fantastic. It makes the game, from my point of view, the, the spirit of it. And he also has some great art books. The game was actually developed from an art book he put together on mm. Scandinavian folklore creatures, which is also called Vesson. And he's just done one on dragons. He's done one on the undead. He's done mm. one on Norse myth. He's a, a great artist and illustrator and also a really nice guy. And we had this long series of uh, email exchanges where we basically geeked out at each other over folklore. And he knows almost as much about British and Irish folklore as I do. It's very mm. impressive. So between us, we came up with a list of creatures to cover, mm. um, you know, that offered the perfect blend of um, interesting gameplay possibilities and storytelling possibilities with being able to make really good illustrations. Mm. And that was the core of the book. And then the... Uh, basically ripped off the chapters from the Vess and Core rule book of yeah. where they describe their setting and everything followed that structure and uh, filled that in with all the necessary information on Britain and Ireland, Victorian London, the rich mm. and the poor, the political struggles, etc. and so forth. And then put together three adventures. They call them mysteries in Vess and three mysteries mm. for, for the back of the book. And there it was. Yeah, it's an incredible supplement. Because I think what's great about Vesson, compared to, say, other 
horror, and I say loosely horror because it's not. I don't think it's sure. really a horror game per se, but it's an like you said, a mm. mystery investigating game. Is that you have this idea of the society, this sort of group of people who gain this uh, ability to suddenly see what has been previously unseen, and th- you can just take that core element and then put it in different cultures, like you've just done with uh, Mythic Britain and Ireland, and it's suddenly it's that sort of thing. For me, is that when I read a book that's based in London, because that's where I'm currently living, I'm like, oh, there's St. Paul's, there's this, I've been there, and something like that. So I think there's something really mm. wonderful about being able to play uh, adventures or play role playing games that are set in your culture or in your sort of areas where you could, you like, I grew up with this story and oh, I'm playing a game about it just now. And I just, yeah. definitely for me, when I was reading it, I was very, very excited about like just reading little bits and pieces because it's you've re- written it in such a way uh, which is a massive compliment to you i appreciate uh, i didn't mean to make this as a compliment first but it's just interesting to read it so succinctly but also like gets that information across and gets people excited about wanting to run mystery games about the supernatural Thank you. And that's exactly what I was aiming to do. One of the first things, you know, when I discovered Call of Cthulhu in the uh, in the early 80s, and it was the first game I discovered that wasn't in a fantasy setting, was that, oh, there's all these places that I know and I could run a game, you know, in my hometown or where I was at college in Durham and invoke lots of local folklore and explain it in mythos terms. But this and being entirely uh, folklore based, mm. um, it was just, uh, yeah. I love that. Because that's the thing. I think many people might come to it and be like, oh, so it's like Call of Cthulhu. And I want to say, like, in a way, the mystery is the most important part of it rather than the horror. It can, you like, we can have elements of horror in it, but just this idea, like, is is a mystery for you to find out and maybe not solve. And that's okay. (laughs) That's right. And I noticed in the last few years, there's been a sort of a growing wave of what's called folk horror, but as you rightly say, more like folk mystery folk adventure but folklore inflected stuff in the zeitgeist it kind of started with the nicholas cage remake of the wicker man yes but then there's been various tv series like uh i think of older ones like sleepy hollow and grim um Mm. and there's a few more folklore inflected games coming up Mm. and i'm really glad to see that there's definitely an interest building yeah. In Call of Cthulhu, there's this idea of having a lot of combat, even though it's pointless, right? <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> yes. These are eldritch beings, and you're like, well, you could try shooting mm. at it, sure. Whereas here, it's not about killing, it's about no. doing rituals and putting them to rest because of this big contract with the face. And I thought that was such a different angle, which I hadn't, again, seen yeah. before in a role-playing game. And just instantly, mm. I, I, my heart was like, oh, great, because I don't, A, don't really have to think about combat too hard, because that's always right. a big part of the game, but also means it allows people to be that storytelling stuff. And having that focus on yeah. the investigator who has gained this sort of sight to see these these creatures, mm. working that into the backstory a little bit, and I, I just felt it was just a bit more personal. And I don't know, just, just something about it was just yeah. instantly more attractive, certainly to me as a, as a GM. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. There's there's more sort of thinking to it, you know, and mm. um, combat in many ways, you can use it sort of short term to fix the symptom, but the underlying cause remains. And that's where you need to do the investigating and you know, figuring out the correct ritual or what mm. the uh, wrong is that has to be righted and, uh, mm-hmm. and all of that. I've always preferred games that make you think rather than just hitting things or shooting things. Agreed. Especially when it's a collaborative storytelling thing as well. It means that you yeah. have that shared experience. I know like you obviously have online videos video games now but it's that unpredictability and maybe that realization when you're like oh it's we have to do this to placate this creature in some way so then in terms of writing this where did you start obviously you've got, you've got the structure as you as you sort of said was there a particular place you like, i want to write about this first or was it all in uh, little bits and pieces that came to you honestly as i said i started with the structure and that sort of informed everything i knew roughly what i wanted to say about geography and society and the four nations that made up mythic britain and ireland and the tensions within that and mm. that was beautifully modeled in the verse and rule book because that also in their description of the mythic north they cover you know the social stresses of uh, of industrialization and that sort of yeah. thing it's a great period for uh, for setting this kind of thing because of that Mm. So the structure basically gave me the the various buckets that I needed to fill, and I knew mm. what I was filling them with. So uh, away I went. I guess probably the uh, the three mysteries was the um, 
the part where I I had to do most thinking because mm. being me, I had like 20 ideas and I had of to course. pick the best ones. You know, A, that made the best mysteries, the most satisfying adventures, mm. but B, which also provided the best coverage of the geographical area. You know, I still regret that I didn't get to set one in Ireland because there just weren't enough space mm. wasn't enough space the great just uh, variety of threats and types of story just going back to it because you talked about this that obviously it's set like you said in the 1800s in this era of industrialization as well again it feels very different to call of Cthulhu, which obviously you can set it in modern day 1920s etc whereas this is like no it has to be here because of that rising intentions and stuff and i was just like oh yes mm. Was there a particular favourite bit that you were writing? Any particular creature that you were like, oh, I'm really glad I got this in? This was some conversation between me and Johan, but there's a, a Scottish creature called a Knuckle RV. Yes, I we, love them. Yeah, that was, I was going to say that was my favourite one. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the weirdest thing you can imagine. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's either a sort of a centaur or it's a horse and rider that are fused together as a single beast. And it's got no skin and it's got black blood and yellow organs and it's the most horrifying thing. And, you know, I, I said to Johan, do you think you can make a picture of this? And we'd already discussed a, a few things that sort of had to go on the pile because he said, I could draw this, but it just wouldn't look cool. It would look kind of comical. So, OK, that had to go. But the Knuckle RV, we both agreed that would be a, a really fun thing to do. Yeah, yeah, I will say the illustration of that just really jumps out of the page. It's very, very much like how I imagine like Sleepy Hollow, but even worse. <laughs> <laughs> There you yeah, go. Yes. Yeah, I was like, whoa. And yes, yeah, like from this sort of Orkney Island sort of thing. So I was just like, that's really cool. Like an isolated place where these creatures are found. Yeah, no, I ticked that one. I was like, when I run this game, I was like, that's going to be one of the, the big creature. I was just like, yeah, because that's such a cool, cool aspect of it. So no, oh, I'm, I'm very glad I'm you very said happy. that. I was like, oh. <laughs> well, I'm very happy you said that. <laughs> you did mention briefly that you couldn't necessarily set an uh, adventure in Ireland just because there wasn't enough geographical space i think there was a no, enough kept... space in the book unfortunately oh, there, there was only go. room for, for three adventures and i thought i had to do one in london you know because victorian london is so iconic from you know carnival row to it it's what everybody thinks of and everybody wants to meet sherlock holmes and all the rest of that you've got that list of like obviously important people of the time as well which again i yeah. it felt very much like there's a film by woody allen which is midnight in paris where like a writer mm. meets all his favorite yeah. people that's what i felt like this could be is that you just sprinkle in a few people yeah. as npcs and you're like oh wait was that the great sherlock holmes or was that bram stoker and yeah i was like i like that idea and that's again a succinct little paragraph about each of them was there any part of the book that you really wanted to keep in but couldn't because of editing stuff so obviously i know you mentioned that that irish image but was there like you said more creatures you were planning to put in yes i i came up with a a short list, short list uh, of about <laughs> 20 odd creatures oh, wow. uh, that I felt would have been essential. And I forget how many we got in. I think it was initially 10, but was the uh, Kickstarter kind of enabled the book to expand a bit. We added mm. a few more, but there were still some I regretted. And, and the particular one I mentioned earlier about Johan not being confident to draw it was uh, a Scottish beast called a Fachan. Folklore says he has one leg out of the middle of his haunch. He has one arm out of the middle of his chest. He has one eye in the middle of his head and he has in the middle of his face and he has one tuft on the top of his head and it's this <laughs> sort of half person hopping ogre beast and there were a few others as well luckily free league has this program called the free league workshop where you can publish community content on drive through so uh, i've uh, put up a few creatures on there who uh, didn't quite make it into the book nice a little bit of extra dlc essentially but that's awesome more or less yeah <laughs> What would you say to somebody who's going to run Vesa and is going to use the supplement? What would be your big advice or big takeaway message for them to run it? Well, as with all things role playing, I always say make it your own. There's stuff that's written down in the book. That's guidelines. That's a setup, you know, like the pirate code. It's not so much rules as guidelines. And it's up to you. Mm -hmm. uh, at your table, in your game, you can do whatever you like. So don't be afraid to you know, stretch, fold, spindle, mutilate, um, expand. It's all about imagination, this hobby. So just go for it and go wherever your mind takes you. And that's where the, the greatest fun is. Thank you so much, Graham, for this this very, very short interview. But like I, like I said, like I just really, really enjoyed 
reading your stuff and I'm like, it makes me inspired to run a game of Vesta now. My next question is, do you have any other projects that are coming up? I appreciate you've just done Mythic Britain and you're like, I need a break. Um, but is there anything <laughs> else you've got coming up that you'd like to talk about or able to talk about depending on NDAs and stuff? Um, well, yes, I'd like to just <laughs> mention Rookery Publications, if I may. Of course. Um, when I was working on The Enemy Within Director's Cut for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition a couple of years ago, I met uh, Andy Law, who is a... I don't think there's a job in this industry that Andy has not done. He's managed a Games <laughs> Workshop store. He's a cartographer, a writer, an artist. He's done layout. He managed uh, Woofer at 4 for Cubicle 7 for a little while. And anyway, we, we kind of got talking, and the result was that together with Mark Gibbons, who's a fantastic artist from Warhammer and World of Warcraft and a number of other things that I'm currently forgetting. Sorry, Mark. Um <laughs> and uh, some other Edinburgh-based writers, Andy Leesk and Lindsay Law. We all worked in various degrees on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition, and we decided to, you know, basically just form our own little company and do stuff that we think is cool, and the result was Rookery Publications. Uh, we've got a couple of small things out on drive through at the moment, and uh, they were mainly sort of just sort of test pieces to figure our process out. They've got five star reviews and we're very happy with them because uh, we, we wouldn't put anything else out. Of it. We wouldn't put anything out unless we were absolutely happy with it. <laughs> but the longer term goal is to put together a fantasy city setting in sort of serial form with an accompanying campaign and accompanying bestiaries and so on. And we are doing it all system agnostic. Mm. We're developing our own. It sounds ridiculous, but we've developed a systemless statting system. <laughs> systemless system. Um, and we've got wonderful play testers who've uh, adapted it to everything from D&D &D to Call of Cthulhu to Traveller taken it completely out of the fantasy genre, played our, our initial adventures, uh, one of which is nearing completion right now. So that's the plan. We're going to be building this fantasy city, which mm -hmm. can be dropped into any fantasy, it's designed to be dropped into any fantasy world or campaign uh, with any rule set. And, you know, the, the team that brought you the enemy within director's cut is, is uh, hopefully riding again and doing our own campaign set in this setting that we've designed, free from the constraints of anybody else's property. And so we can just do what we like and we hope everybody else likes it too. Oh, amazing. And yeah, I'm such a big fan of, of content that is system agnostic, just because then you can, like you say, you can put it into any system and it's not, you're not bound by, oh, but I only do this or all my players only know X system, etc. So no, that, what a great idea. And yeah, kudos to that and best of luck. That sounds absolutely Thanks. amazing. I will be looking out for that as well. My final, yeah. final, final question, Graham, is where can we find you if you're on, uh, if you're on the internet, if you're on social media, <laughs> where can we find a Mythic Britain and Ireland, the supplement for Vesson? Right. Well, I'll start with that first. I believe the release date has been announced now as October the 11th for general release. It's already gone out to the Kickstarter backers and they seem to be liking it. So that's always very gratifying. Um, <laughs> I've been seeing lots and... of hardback pictures like, look at this. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I have to wait for the uh, the main release. So I'm like, come on. <laughs> So as I say, I believe it's October 11th. Where you can find me? Well, uh, let's start with where you can find the Rookery. And they're on Facebook as just Rookery Publications, on Twitter as at Rookery P. But I really want to mention the YouTube channel because one of the things we do when we're not putting together this campaign and everything is we do a more or less weekly live stream called Inside the Rookery. Between us, we've been in the industry for about 100 years. We know a lot of people. So we've got some really cool people came on. Matt Forbeck to talk about his Marvel RPG. We just had Ben Aronovich talking about Rivers of London and the yes. upcoming RPG for that. Exciting. We had Mark Gascoigne talking about his memories of Games Workshop from way back when and starting Warhammer Fiction, and now he's head of fiction for uh, Aconite, which is all the Asmodee Games titles. We have some wonderful guests, and they're all on the YouTube channel, which, again, is just Rookery Publications. Plus, we have a, a community on Discord. Uh, where we discuss not just what the rookery is doing, but uh, there's good sort of general discussions of various games and films and whatever else comes to mind. And there's even a little section for Vesson because I <laughs> they, they kindly put that in for me after I did this book. 
oh that's sweet <laughs> so, you, so the people don't have to hide their talk about it they have a little channel for it as well that's awesome that's right. and i'll be checking out that youtube channel because i love a uh, good rpg discussion stuff and so yeah that sounds exciting and yeah the rivers of london stuff i'm really looking forward to that I bet that was an exciting interview it really was yeah thank you so much graham i really appreciate your time oh, well. and uh yeah i know it's just it's just been i'm very excited to play this and thank you so much for writing such a wonderful supplement and i yeah like i said i can't wait to to play it and put it in front of my players well thank you very much for having me on i'm hoping to do more of these q a bonus episodes in future including q a's on the one shots we've run here at what am i rolling if you have a question or think of an rpg designer you would like to see interviewed on this podcast let us know our email address is whatamirollingpodcast at gmail.com. And that's it. Great. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.